and process development in the research and, develop and development division at the Aldor Tops in Denmark. He will give us the keynote lecture titled The Use of Synchrotron Radiation in Industrial Catalysis Research. As usual, you can ask your question in the question and answer window at the end of presentation. Please mute your microphones in order to avoid unpleasant sounds. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Beato, you can start. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Alberto, for the introduction. Thanks a lot to the organizers of the conference to give me the opportunity to talk here today. So as uh, Alberto already said, and as you can see, I'm going to talk about catalysis research, industrial catalysis research, and how we have been using synchrotron radiation uh, in this field. So I will give a very short introduction to Topsur, and then I will, uh, I will make a, a brief, give you a brief overview of uh, the 40 years of synchrotron use uh, in the company. And then I will, I will move on to give you some examples in, in different fields that we have been working on uh, and, and finalize with some conclusions. And uh, maybe just what I'm trying to do is also to give you a kind of, a, it's not going to be so much in depth uh, on, on, on the spectroscopy part. I have to also really say that I'm a user. So this is a user meeting. I'm a user and I, I uh, uh, of course, we do this from an industrial point of view. So I would like also to tell you a little bit more about the background somehow that, that leads us to do this type of research. Okay, so very brief uh, about Haldor Topsu, the company. So we work in the field of heterogeneous catalysis and um, we have roughly 2,300 employees uh, around the world. Uh, our headquarters are in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And we have some production facility here in Denmark uh, uh, and another one in, uh, in the US, in Houston. The company was uh, actually established 1940 by Dr. Halder Topser, which is uh, the name of the company. And we spent quite a, I would say, quite a significant amount of our revenue in R&D. And the reason for this is that our founder, Halder Topser, he was a physicist. And, uh, and uh, he really had a passion for, for science. And so he really, when he founded the company, um, uh, he, was, uh, he was driven by this idea to really learn uh, about this field, heterogeneous catalysis, the, the, the fundamentals of, of, of the, 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 the processes on an atomic scale to really understand what is happening, uh, which would then lead to, uh, to improve the solutions, improve products. And uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the photo that you see in the background, there is, uh, let me just see and shift uh, to the pointer here. Um, so you can see here is uh, Halder Topser next to Niels Bohr uh, on their way to uh, Geneva to participate in 1958 at the UN International Conference on the Peaceful Use of Atomic Energy. Um, so this drive for passion, I think uh, this is really what, what has brought us in the last 40 years, uh, moved us uh, in, the, in the world of, of synchrotrons and, uh, and, and other advanced techniques that I'm going to, to talk about a little bit today. So here, what I, what I show you is a Scopus search uh, where you type in on, on synchrotron, XAFs, XANGs, XAFs, uh, XRD, SACS in combination with catalysis. And what you can see is that actually there was actually an industrial push in the very, in the very beginning in the 80s when, when actually the first synchrotron facilities became uh, dedicated to materials research. And, um, and so in the, in the very beginning, actually the share of, of, of the industry was actually quite, was quite, quite large actually. Uh, so compared to, uh, to, uh, to the total number of publications. But then you can see, of course, that this ratio uh, slowly decreased. And uh, I think today, if you, in the catalysis field, uh, there is roughly, uh, in, over the last two decades, is around 100 publications coming out in the field and around 3% of, uh, of these publications is from industry. And, and I would say that probably most of these 3% is coming 
uh, from our company. There is maybe uh, there is maybe four or five other companies that are also uh, active in the field, um, but I would say the large um, the large share of this is probably from Topsir. So if we look back uh, time wise, then um, Topsir started to uh, to work in synchrotrons. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, starting in Hamburg at the Hasi lab. Uh, um, and, uh, and actually this has been also our main, uh, the, the, the main uh, synchrotron for, for us, simply also because it's close. And then we, we are usually, uh, I still have participated. So I'm now working for 15 years in the company. And in the beginning, uh, we, we used to go very often also with a, with a small van uh, where we bring all our equipment there uh, and, and we could, would drive around five hours to Hamburg and, and there we have, have done most of our experiments. Later on in the 19, the years, 1990s, the ESRF came to it. And, uh, and, and also we drove with the van to, uh, to Grenoble actually sometime. It's a, a, a really um, a longer tour for us. But then later on, of course, closer, much closer to us in Lund, the Max Lab, uh, then also uh, Anka in Karlsruhe and also the Porchera Institute. Um, and uh, we hope, of course, I mean, we are still continuing in, in, uh, in, in participating in, in most of these um, synchrotrons. What are we doing and why are we doing this is uh, what we are trying to do really is some sort of um, we, we have our reactor where we load our catalyst, the heterogeneous catal catalyst, and then the, the reactants, which typically is gases, they flow over it. And what we became aware of is that it's very important to actually look at this catalyst while it is working. And um, because the, the structure of these, of these catalysts very often, depending on the gas conditions and the atmosphere, uh, the temperature, um, uh, the structure will change. So we have used, and we're still using a lot of different methods, uh, um, spectroscopic methods to look under in situ, sometimes we so call it also operando conditions with the idea to understand the, the structure of the active uh, catalyst. And, and of course, with the idea to establish structure property relationships and by doing this and, and, and understanding this improve our catalysts. Um, so these structure property relationships under industrial relevant conditions um, has led us to, to really uh, studying our, our investigations in, um, in, with synchrotrons uh, back to the 80s where we started uh, to work uh, with a so-called COMOS catalyst in hydro treating. And I have marked here in red the, the topics that I'm going to talk about uh, Today, uh, I can see here. So there will be in the beginning, in the, it's a couple of examples from the very beginning uh, in the 1980s and 1990s about the copper, zinc, and methanol. And then later in the more recent years, I will talk a bit uh, about the field of zeolites, which is a very active field for myself working in this. Um, so this is what you're going to, to hear about. But of course we have been investigating many, many more systems and what I'm going to, to talk about of you uh, today. So starting uh, with the first topic, actually, that is a very important one for us is the hydro treating uh, of, uh, of uh, different oil streams and oil refineries. What is hydro treating? So here on the right, you can see how a typical refinery is built up. And you know, the crude oil comes in, is distillated into the different fractions. So you get your different, your, your diesel, jet fuel, your gasoline, the oils. Um, and, and then you get a vacuum distillation. What is common to all of these different streams is that they need to be hydro treated. And in hydro treating, what we are doing is we are removing, so to say, all the bad compounds that are in the oil, the sulfur, the nitrogen, the metals, uh, all what you don't want to have in your final application in your fuels, this needs to be removed. And in most of the refineries, this is done with hydro treating. Hydro treating, it means that you're mixing in your reactor you have a high pressure of hydrogen. So reaction conditions is roughly 40 to 200 bars of hydrogen at relatively high temperature, 300, 400 degrees. And you use a catalyst and this catalyst is a, is a molybdenum sulfide or also tungsten sulfide. And it's doped with, uh, with nickel or cobalt and then it's supported uh, on, on alumina. Um, 
this is a little bit what, uh, what we used to do. And uh, I, I have also here integrated another slide a little bit to, to say that uh, nowadays, uh, what can, becomes for us really a, a, a really a big business and, and it is of course the future is the renewable fuel. So, so not so more fossil fuels anymore, but then we go over and, uh, and we get uh, seed oils, animal fats, pyrolysis oil, toll oil. And for most of these compounds, you still uh, actually need hydro treating. Um, so here, what you're mainly removing is not so much uh, sulfur and nitrogen, also these, of course, but to a large extent, what you have to remove is oxygen, actually. So again, what you do is you, you mix uh, your, your, uh, your feed with hydrogen and you deoxygenate uh, uh, the, these, for example, here I have, uh, this is a, these, these fatty acid type of, of molecules. This is what you have in the renewable fields. And guess what? You, you Again, the conditions are quite similar, maybe a bit lower temperature, but you use the same type of catalyst. So all the knowledge that we have obtained since the 80s uh, from the oil refineries is also applicable to all the renewable fuels. And this is something that is in the company, we call this the Hydroflex process, where we where we, uh, we are actually currently the world leader in, in these type of re renewable field uh, treatment of renewable uh, fuels. So first uh, in situ uh, techniques uh, used here was in the beginning, uh, Bjarne Clausen and Henrik Topsø, the son of Halder Topsø in the beginning in 1981, comes the first uh, in situ EXAF study uh, looking onto these catalysts. And then um, a little bit later actually um, in, uh, this was I think in 84, Pointer, yeah. Um, then you, 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 they actually, by using a combination of in situ Mössbauer and in situ Exafs, both here it says on the molybdenum on the cobalt edge, they found out that actually the active phase in this catalyst is, yes, is the molybdenum sulfide, but that these cobalt atoms that they are actually located at the edges of these particles, these nanoparticles that are lying on the support. And, um, and this was, is, is still today, actually, since that time is, is known as the Topsil model in the field. And uh, I think the research really to understand the atomic structure of this is started here uh, with, with these uh, initial investigations and led to something which we uh, later on called the BRIM technology, actually. So this identification of these additional atoms at the edge, which are actually promoters of the uh, of the molybdenum sulfide is what we play what we uh, trademark it as the prim the brim technology and in and that is still today actually one of our super selling uh, um, um, catalysts actually in the field i have to say to be honest that exas did not do the job alone and this is something uh, also a, a message an overall message of my talk that of course we use synchrotron techniques but alone, this, these techniques will, will never really allow you to see the overall picture. So, uh, so and, and, and especially in this case, I would say that there has been a lot of debate really on the interpretation also of the data as in many other fields probably is the case. And I must say here, we have also had a lot of help uh, by, for example, this is the picture of our old in situ TM, I think is the only uh, uh, TM in the world where you could have sulfur inside uh, inside a TEM. So, so we would actually do experiments uh, looking into the, the, the sulfide state of these catalysts uh, doing in situ sulfidation experiments in a transmission electron microscope. And also we were working a lot on, uh, on, on, the, um, on tunneling uh, microscopy together with the University of Aarhus, which really confirmed actually the initial work on the, at the synchrotron that these promoter atoms, so these cobalt uh, atoms, that they were actually sitting at the edges and that these were actually the active sites of this catalyst. Going over to another topic, um, methanol. Methanol is, uh, is also, is one of our, is, is, is um, the catalyst to produce methanol is, is a big product for, for our company. Methanol, methanol is an essential bulk chemical, C1 building block from methanol you can make a lot of other uh, products. Um, so here I have just uh, named some of them like formaldehyde, which again is used in a lot of different indus industries, acetic acid, also uh, cause for this dimethyl uh, uh, 
tephthalate, which is the base for recyclable plastic bottles, uh, and so on. And nowadays, uh, we use methanol and other fuels, and I will come to that uh, a bit later. Um, just to give you an idea, the demand this year for methanol is over 100 million metric tons per year. So, so you can see that this is really a, a, a big, uh, a large product. And in Halder Top, so we have roughly in this field uh, a quarter of the world market. So this is a big business for us again. Methanol um, in the making, so it's made from synthesis gas actually. So synthesis gas is a mixture of CO, CO2 and hydrogen. This is again why methanol also uh, these days is, is, is becoming very interesting. Many people talk about the methanol economy and mainly because of the, of the reaction that you see here in the bottom, that is the so-called uh, water gas shift reaction, also where you actually can convert with the reverse water gas shift reaction. So it's a reversible reaction where you can actually convert CO2 to a mixture, to a synthesis gas mixture. And from this synthesis gas mixture, you can make uh, again chemicals. So it's a, it's a way how to produce chemicals from CO2 and hydrogen and the hydrogen these days, uh, you, you would like to get that from, uh, from, uh, from fuel cells, from, uh, from uh, electrolyzers. So by, by uh, water splitting uh, ideally, of course. So methanol um, it typically in today still is, is run um, at a temperature range between 200, 250 degrees at a high pressure, 50 to 100 bars. And the plants are large, really methanol plants. They produce 5,000 tons uh, per day of methanol. Um, the catalyst that we are producing uh, looks like this. Uh, so the black, uh, so initially it's the size is, is roughly uh, six millimeters in diameter, four millimeter in height. Uh, looks like a little black smarty actually. And uh, this is the catalyst that we are using and many, many tons of this, uh, uh, this catalyst are produced and then put into a so-called boiling water reactor. And what we are really interested, of course, is, is the nanostructure of, of this catalyst, uh, which is composed of, uh, of copper, of zinc oxide, and of aluminum oxide. Uh, okay, this is, uh, I'll just quickly go through this. So we have been really developing this since the early, uh, since the 80s, and there's a number of generation of methanol catalysts. And today we have around uh, 47 references in the world. And, and more than 50,000 metric tons per day of methanol produced with these type of catalysts. Just to give you an idea about dimensions we are talking about here, what this research also has been good for, you know. And so in 91, uh, this is work at the, in Hamburg, uh, Doris, uh, we started to look at the methanol catalyst. Uh, that was roughly also in the beginning, really the first generation of catalysts where Bjarne Clausen and Henrik Topser again, Bjarne Clausen, who actually became uh, also a CEO of the company for some year, and Henrik Topser, as I said, the son of Haldor, uh, who also became the, the chair of the board of, of, of Topser. Um, they looked into, look at this, this is at 220 degrees, four, uh, uh, 48 bars. Uh, so this is what I meant where we are trying to look at realistic conditions really, so they developed already at that point methods to look at the catalyst at, at the right conditions. And what they saw was that actually the active material is really metallic copper, which somehow sits, uh, is close to the zinc oxide. And at that point they were saying, although the zinc oxide is not essential for the methanol synthesis, the results point to a strong influence of the zinc oxide on the structure of the copper phase formed. Um, now, this was in 1991, and a bit later, um, they were doing, and again, this is an in situ investigation at a synchrotron where they combined XRD with uh, EXAFs. Uh, this was uh, actually done again by, by Henrik, Bjarne, but also here, Jan Dirk Grunwald, who is now professor in Karlsruhe uh, and responsible for the catalysis beam line there at, uh, at uh, uh, at KIT. Um, and what they could see is actually that then there, there came up a, a, a little bit newer picture somehow that was also seeing that maybe the zinc was not just a support for the copper, but in reality, some of the zinc could actually, depending on the conditions, could crawl on the copper nanoparticles. And, uh, and, and that that was actually 
must be the real active phase. So, so you can see that this picture that was drawn in 2000 based on these investigations. And uh, again, uh, later on, uh, so just a couple of years later, there was a publication in Science by, by TOPSO members where they looked again within C to TM and found out that actually depending on the, on the conditions there, that the copper particles would actually change the shape and, and actually allowed again to, to, to say which type of copper particle surfaces actually were the active ones. And then uh, in another publication, again, here from, from Topsu in 2016, some four years ago, we can see the same picture actually that was already here established from, from the first synchrotron experiments, where we can see that depending on the hydrogen partial pressure, the methanol activity is increasing. And with these hydrogen partial pressure, we can see that the zinc coverage of the particles is increasing and that actually with this increase, increased sur surface coverage, the activity of the catalyst is improving, actually. Okay, I move from here to the next topic, which is uh, when you are uh, a producer for catalysts for methanol, so you make methanol, then of course you're also interested, what can you make from the methanol? And there, I think a very important reaction to name is uh, the methanol to hydrocarbons reactions, short also MTH as a general uh, a term. Uh, so I said already in the beginning, synthesis gas can be converted to methanol. There's many different ways today how you can come to synthesis gas, also how you can come to methanol. So uh, I would say um, in some years ago and still today, we think about biomass, but of course the future is more about converting CO2 with hydrogen, ideally a green hydrogen with, uh, with CO2 that you can either sequestrate from, from big cement steel plants or in the, in the future, maybe also just from the ambient. Huh? And then you can produce methanol. And what you can do then is you can actually take the methanol and react it over a zeolite catalyst under specific reaction conditions and transform the methanol into hydrocarbons. And this is the so-called methanol to hydrocarbons reaction. The zeolite catalyst, um, just to quickly say the zeolites, this is the, the catalyst is microporous materials. And here I just have uh, just uh, extracted a couple of structures of different zeolites. So this is, uh, it's, in it, it's in principle something like sand, it's a silicon oxide, but then it has aluminum atoms in there, which creates a charge imbalance. And with this charge imbalance, you can actually have cut ions, uh, which in the case of protons, you make it these acidic solids, which can catalyze reactions. And the pores of these catalysts, they have about the size, I have here drawn a benzene molecule of, of a molecule, which makes these uh, zeolites very often also called molecular sieves because they have the size of different molecules. So depending on the pore size, you can allow certain molecules to enter into the pores, react in these, and, and then get out depending in, on, on the size of the pores really is the so-called shape selectivity that these materials have. It's a very fascinating world, these materials. And, and this is the, what I have been working in the last 15 years on it. And depending on the zeolites and the reaction conditions, you can then have a number of different processes. So you can make aromatics, you can make gasoline, you can make olefins. And today we are looking into making uh, jet fuels or kerosene, uh, a diesel, alpha olefins, all kinds of chemicals from methanol, ideally, of course, from so-called e-methanol, green methanol, uh, to make uh, uh, this as a platform for making chemicals instead from, uh, from fossil resources. Huh? Um, so this is something where Topsu is actually uh, a leader, again, in, in this type of technology. So we are, have actually the world's only natural gas to gasoline plant, which operates in Turkmenistan. And that is because Turkmenistan, they are sitting on a lot of gas. They don't have a lot of oil, but they have a lot of gas. And, uh, and what they really want to do is they want to liquefy this gas and they want to make chemicals out of it. Uh, and uh, eventually also, for example, gasoline out of it. And, um, and so uh, we have built this plant. It's operating since 2019 and creates uh, uh, around 100, uh, 1,800 tons of gasoline per day. On the right hand, you have actually the gasoline reactor. So they are filled with the zeolite here. Uh, it's five reactors in parallel. 
And um, here I have just the schematic drawing of this. So the methanol comes in and then reacts over these five parallel reactors here. And then, uh, well, you have here, you, you have some, some, some uh, recycle, of course, also. And, and at the end, you can, you can uh, get different types of products out here. Um, the reaction runs at 280, 360 degrees, uh, 10 to 30 bars. And the point here really is, and why you have so many parallel reactors, is that uh, the catalyst is actually deactivating slowly. So after roughly six weeks or so, uh, the nice, uh, so here uh, the, 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 the zeolite is a white powder, which we press into, uh, into these pellets or these extrudates, we extrude them actually. They, they are like long spaghettis and then we make little pieces out of it. But after six weeks, you can see that this nice uh, white zeolite, these pores of the zeolite, they have filled up with carbon actually. They get black and then the catalyst needs to be regenerated periodically. Um, and, uh, and that's why you have these many reactors in parallel. So each of these reactor uh, has a, a diameter, I think is, is roughly five, six meters in diameter. So there's a lot of catalysts that, that you can put in there. But when, um, so from time to time, you have to regenerate them. And this is of course a process that we were very interested. How actually does the deactivation of the catalyst occur and how can we regenerate this? So there uh, we have been using a lot of uh, different methods actually to look into this process. And here is just uh, an example of um, what we have been doing with XRD because we, we saw actually that XRD is a very sensitive method to follow the deactivation of this catalyst. Um, first of all, of course, you can see that the relative intensities from a fresh to a, to a coke catalyst are changing. But more importantly, if you look into a certain, er certain area of this, um, of this zeolite, you can see that this specific zeolite, which is a ZSM5 zeolite, has an autorhombic structure. It means that uh, the cell parameters uh, are not the same. So A is not the, as B is not as C. But what you can see is that when as these micropores fill up with carbon molecules, that slowly the structure is changing. And when the coke, the fully coke catalyst, actually these two peaks from the autorhombic structure, they merge into one. So, so is a quasi tetragonal uh, distortion of, of the crystal so that the A parameter becomes equal to the B parameter. And then uh, to the, the, the A um, um, uh, lattice constant becomes equal to the B lattice constant. And, and, and that's what we have used as a parameter actually uh, to, to follow the deactivation. So, so this is experiment that we did at, uh, at the ESRF uh, at the Swiss Norwegian beam line, uh, time and spatially resolved operando study where we did the reaction actually. So you can see here on the top, the fresh capillary loaded with a catalyst, the C fraction, so that's just the same catalyst that we, that we use normally. It's just crushed down in small particles. And then we do the reaction and we divided the bed into, uh, into 10 different zones. And, uh, and then we would look, actually follow the deactivation of this catalyst with uh, operando uh, XRD. Um, and later we'll also show that we also did some tomography actually on, on, on these catalysts. But what you can, what you, what you get out of this is actually, and here you can see, so we followed the whole reaction with a mass spectrometer, just to be also sure, of course, that the reaction is really happening. So you look into the, uh, that, you, that you have a conversion of methanol and DME and you get your products out. Products here, we look at uh, some alkenes and toluene. And, um, and here is the TOS means the time on stream. So here we start our reaction. And what you can see is actually, <clears throat> If you look into the structural parameter, the A minus B parameter. So, so basically in the beginning of a fresh catalyst, the A minus B parameter, A is different from B. So you basically, you have a large difference. And as A becomes equal to B, then A minus B becomes zero. So for a completely deactivated catalyst, the A minus B parameter becomes zero. So, uh, so what you can see is actually then, then the very first part of the bed, uh, here this yellow part, you can see that that one never becomes really zero. That has something to do with the reaction itself because it's a autocatalytic reaction. So in the very beginning, actually, you need to create first a certain amount of species that autocatalyze the reaction. But once the, the reaction has, has really started, then you can see that uh, it's, it's what we call a burning cigar 
a mechanism. You can see how slowly uh, the, 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 this part of the bed is deactivating and how actually the reaction front is progressing towards the end of the reactor slowly. Yeah? And, and how this slowly, you can see how all the, the catalyst bed really at the end, A minus B becomes zero. And, and we have a fully deactivated catalyst. Of course, from this type of experiments, we learn a lot uh, on, uh, on, on, on we, can, we, can, we can use this, this information to really uh, model the deactivation in the reactor, predict when we have to regenerate, et cetera. Um, here, just a, a quick one from, um, uh, from uh, the pilot. So you can also do tomography. So now instead of a capillary, we look into a pilot plant reactor, which has a size of two meters height and uh, 0.4 meter in, dia in, in diameter. And then we take out pellets or, or at, different, at, at different positions in the reactor. So it's basically the same, but now we do it with a real reactor and with the real pellets. And then we take the cross section of these pellets at different positions. And what is plotted here color-wise is again, the A minus B parameter, so zero, very blue means completely deactivated, and then uh, fresh is the yellow one. And you can, and, and the right hand we have the same, but for the electron density uh, of of this material. And you can see that, uh, yeah, it's actually uh, very nice here on the very top of the bed. We have like a rim here, and that corresponds to to the capillary where we had in the very beginning also this white zone. So we can see there is a little rim here uh, on the first on the top of the bed, and then it comes this deactivated at the end. The catalyst is still has is, is actually deactivated at the outer surface, but still the inner part of the pellet is actually still active. And uh, you can do that, of course, also in an individual pellet, uh, and 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 then slice basically an, a pellet uh, into into different sections, really, and see how is it an individual pellet really looks like. Yeah? So here, really, is, you can see how we go from a, a small capillary. Transfer and, and translate this information into a large pilot plant reactor. Last topic, I can see I have only a few minutes left actually, is actually another, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a dream reaction. So we have seen methanol normally is produced from syngas, um, but there's also um, in, 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 so what typically you, you have a natural gas, which you have to uh, 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 reform to make a synthesis gas. So, so this mixture of CO, CO2 and hydrogen, but what if you could go directly from methane to methanol? That is what we call a dream reaction. And that's a dream reaction because actually the reaction is possible. So it is an exothermic reaction. And in principle, you could do it. The problem is that once you start this reaction, it's very difficult to stop it. So normally what happens is actually that this reaction just runs through and to produce CO2, the total oxidation product actually. So what you really want is you want to stop the reaction at a certain point at methanol and then not further react, which is difficult because methane is much more stable than methanol. So the reaction tends to just go through. That's why uh, uh, we are looking for catalysts for this. And we know that nature is actually able to do that. There are some enzymes that actually can do this, the so-called methane uh, oxygenase uh, enzymes. They can do this actually. And the active centers of these enzymes they are supposed to be iron and copper dimers. Uh, in, and so one of the ideas that were followed was actually to say, can we actually um, use zeolites again? And so to say, um, um, graft in these zeolites, in, the, in this environment of these micropores, uh, a sites which mimic these enzymes. And so we have been looking into this and we have, uh, that, that it is possible to, to make this reaction Currently, we are doing this in some sort of a cyclic process. Uh, um, so you basically have first, you, what you do is you activate oxygen, which is a very important step here. And then you actually uh, let react your activated material with methane. And in the last step, you're actually dissolving your methanol uh, with, uh, with a stream of uh, water vapor, actually. And then you start the reaction again. It's just some sort of a looping uh, reaction. Alberto is the last slide now, I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. Uh, um, but it's a complicated slide. <laughs> uh, then uh, you can see here that um, this is really uh, bringing a lot of work into one slide. Sorry for that, it's a, very, it's, it's a bit of a, a busy slide here. But what we did actually is, uh, so these two samples is two different zeolites with different amounts of copper. 
different composition. One is a very good sample that was this 18 copper H modernite seven and the other one was a very bad sample. So we tried to compare a good and a bad and we did different activations in helium and in oxygen and followed that with a time resolved uh, 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 xanes uh, uh, with high energy uh, uh, resolution and fluorescence mode. And, and from these data, actually, what you can do then is you can do a principle, principle component analysis because there's not only just one type of species, but there's a number of species. So first of all, you try to see what type of copper species do I have in the material. You can do this multivariate curve resolution analysis where you actually normalize your xane spectra uh, at each temperature and, and composition. And then you actually uh, uh, make uh, each spectrum a, 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 a linear combination of, uh, of, of, uh, of these different species that you, uh, these pure species actually. And so we have found five different species there. And then you can follow uh, um, these different species, how they evolve in these different, in these two different samples, depending on the atmosphere and depending on the, the temperature actually. And, uh, and so you can really see that, yeah, in the beginning you have some water in the system, these blue species. So as we go up in temperature, this species disappears and other species appear and they evolve with temperature. And um, to make a long, so you can actually, if you're really more interested in this, you can read these, these things uh, in more detail. But what came out really at the end is when you combine this with activity measurements really, at the same time is that you that uh, when you plot the activated amount of methane actually per mole of copper and you plot it against uh, one of these species where um, uh, that we find in the zeolite then you can actually see that there's a very nice no matter how you actually activate and which sample you take they all fall on this line which has a slope of one half and uh, and that actually uh, is an agreement that uh, that uh, or we think this is a quantitative evidence for for the active species must be a decopper site actually. So the last question to be answered here is really what type of decopper species it is. Uh, is it uh, the so-called monomer oxo or a peroxo species? And, and that's very difficult to distinguish with saying. So we are currently doing a lot of other techniques also, uh, resonance Raman spectroscopy to follow this. Um, yes. Conclusions, I hope you could see. So for us really, this X-ray based techniques uh, are unique uh, to study catalyst under industrial relevant conditions. Um, it really improves our understanding of catalysts and catalysis. Uh, it also really leads to a better products and, and, and processes. And that's also what we, in a way, of course, as a company also sell. You could say, I think um, our customers not only buy a product, but they also in a way buy knowledge. You no, know? they buy know-how what we have. Um, however, it's very important, of course, you need really, I think not many companies do these kind of things. Uh, you need passionate people. You need the support from the management that really that you can do this, you know? And of course, uh, um, it's usually long-term effort. Uh, it's only a small part of our work. Of course, we have a lot of other activities to support these experiments. Um, but, uh, but at the end, uh, really, this, these techniques can give the, 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 ex, the, the most important part maybe of, 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 a, of a final conclusion there the, to draw, which is the active sites. Acknowledgements to a lot of the colleagues at Topsu um, uh, that have been doing this pioneering work, starting from Haldor and Henrik Topsu, uh, Bjarne Clausen, Alphonse Murenbreg, Anna uh, Molina, uh, and Lars, who's currently in charge of most of these, of course, to the synchrotron facilities that have allowed us to do the work. Uh, special thanks to uh, Carlo Lamberti, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, Elisa Borfecha and, and Kirill, who is working at the ESRF uh, as, a, as a beamline scientist, they have really opened my eyes to the world of X-ray absorption and, uh, and emission techniques and see the potential that it has as a tool for structure reactivity relationships. And of course, 
thanks to all of you. I'm sorry, I went a little bit over time, but we started also a little bit later, I think. Okay, thank you very much, Pablo, for this very nice presentation. So I see that we have a first question. Uh, um, Gerlin Sulzenbacher uh, is asking, you mentioned natural inspired solution. Uh, are you actually looking into enzyme catalysts to transform biomass or uh, carbon dioxide into carbonated or commodity compounds? No, this is not a field uh, of ours. So enzymes uh, is, is still not our field. We have been much more uh, in, the, in the field of, um, of uh, initially fuel cells, and then we did the reversing electrolysis 